welcome everyone to the Business Grid Masterclass series. I'm Obi, an optometrist based here in South Africa, the motherland. And today I've got one of my good old friends, Dr. Emily Seitz, whom I have been connected with over the last few years. She's a fantastic leader. Uh, a few years ago, we did a campaign called the Women in IK Campaign. And when we, it came to writing a, a piece for her, all we could simply write was that she's going to become the biggest IK brand in the entire IK community. Uh, Dr. Seitz, how are you today? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. It's so I'm like grinning from ear to ear um, <laughs> because we finally can have this conversation. And it's we were saying earlier before we hit record, it feels like it's been so long in the making. We're like, why have we not talked sooner and, and just hung out? Yes. But I'm so excited to be here with, with you and everyone that's tuning in. Thank you so much for having me. You could have chosen anything in the world to do, but you landed in IK. How did your IK journey begin? So I actually started as a nursing major in college. Wow. I did not start yeah, in optometry. Um, and I just felt like I didn't, I felt like it just wasn't really my fit. It was kind of healthcare. Yes, I liked healthcare, but I didn't really you know, know or understand why I was going into nursing versus like another field. So I actually ended up switching my major just to biology and I wanted to explore a little bit more. You know, I'd always been interested in optometry. I have been wearing glasses and contacts since I was younger. So when the time came to kind of sit down and think, what is it that I really want to do? I started working in an optometry office. So I was a technician for about two and a half years at uh, a really amazing office in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, it was just the most amazing experience. You know, I'll, I'll, in my, when I applied for optometry school, I would say my um, proposal letter, or the you know, intro letter that you write, I talked about diabetes and really understanding when I was a technician, wow, the general health of people impacts their, their life, like in their vision. And, and, and I felt like there was a disconnect between what patients knew about their health and how it could impact their vision. So I kind of felt this calling to be part of that. Aside from just like doing what optometrists do, I think that a big pull for me was realizing how much, how much like business principles were involved in eye care. I was really, really curious about being a business owner and I felt like optometry just gave you so much that you can do. And so it, it just, it's an easy field to fall in love with. And I, I think that's how I happened into it, as I'm sure many people have. Wow, wow. That is very, very interesting. I did not know that about you. And as, a, as a company, we always view optometry as having three components, an academic, a clinical, and a business side. And all three components need to work cohesively together for anyone or any practice to experience massive success and exponential growth. One thing that we have observed about you over the years is that you have your hand in all three aspects and you didn't, you didn't start that once you qualified. It's, it's as if whilst you were still a student, you had this passion to get involved and you're, you've got this broad approach or perspective on how you approach IK, which has led to you becoming an emerging IK leader on a global space. I wanted to find out from you, were you conscious about building a brand for yourself within the IK industry, or is this something that sort of like evolved as you started growing within the industry? It was absolutely unconscious in the way that it happened. Um, you know, my philosophy was just to experience a little bit of everything. I think in optometry school, a lot of people will go in and they'll kind of put on blinders and they'll be super focused on, okay, how am I going to do on that next exam? How am I going to do on that, that next test? Um, and so much of school is you're just focusing on the academics, but I really was looking at the big picture. I was looking ahead and I was trying to figure out, you know, school's temporary. We're all going to get through it. Let me make sure that I'm setting myself up or at least exploring, exploring some topics that aren't being taught in the curriculum. I think in, in the US, the one, the one issue with our curriculum is we really don't have a huge, robust 
preparation for the business of optometry. And I, I'd like to be part of changing that. Um, but it was just exploratory. I just kind of was like, you know what, I want to go out and I want to learn and I want to meet people and I want to know what is industry? How does industry impact our profession? And so I kind of fell into this and I started documenting my series while I was in optometry school, kind of my experience and journey. Um, and that's what kind of made it its own brand and it's changed and it's grown, but the brand is myself. And so it just follows the path of, of where I'm going in optometry. Wow. Wow. That is absolutely um, fantastic. I've observed that you, you have good relationships with people within the industry who have gone before you, not only the professionals themselves, but the organizations, the companies, the corporates within um, the, the IK community or IK industry. How difficult or easy was it to build those relationships? Or let me put it in another way. How important was it for you in building those relationships? You know, of course, my mentors, as you mentioned, you know, really impressed upon me, hey, this is, this is going to be the way that you approach people if you want to do the things that I'm doing. And so I'm really thankful of that, that mentorship. Um, I think for me, it was just, you know, be showing up time and time again. And you, in a way, you have to almost ensure your relevancy Sometimes you can do that virtually by like virtually connecting and texting or emailing. But for me, I was never really good at that. So I was like, I'm just going to keep showing up to conference and conference and conference. And I'm going to keep reaching out to people and keep, you know, checking in and seeing how they're doing. And so I feel like that was my way of building those relationships from the ground up and building it in a really authentic way is just showing up or checking in and being like, Hey, like, I think we met here. Like, no worries. If you don't remember me, it's okay. I'm just an optometry student. Um, but here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm doing. Tell me what's new with your company. Uh, I think, you know, when you're looking to, to end up working with industry or working with others, a lot of people are in it for what's in it for them. And you might say, okay, I want to be a speaker one day. And so you're thinking about yourself and thinking about yourself and what you want to do, but you really need to keep it into perspective and think about what value you're actually going to give to the company. And so I think I've always approached relationships like that. It's not just about me. It's what can I do to make your company run better? What assets do I have? And I think that that's what makes it a lot stronger and puts me in a better position, if so, <laughs> than, um, than well, going about it in a very self-centered or, or you know, me-centered way. That is so powerful. Uh, would you say that when you were starting out, were there a lot of your peers um, who were sort of like doing the same thing or was it less of you? going out of your way to attend the conferences, get involved in the different components of the industry, or was it just a handful of you who were doing that at the time? That is such a great question um, because it played such an important role. It, there were just a few of us, okay? If I was to look at the people in my class in my optometry school, I could pick it, and we were a huge optometry school. We had 150 people in our class. But there were just a small handful of us that were trying to go to all the conferences and meet other people. Now, the beautiful thing about that, though, is although sometimes I didn't feel very supported at my College of Optometry or I didn't feel very understood at my College of Optometry, it was so amazing to go out to the conferences and meet other people from other schools that uh -huh. felt the exact same way at their schools. <laughs> so we became this own little group of, of, of people that we, you know, we sat down at this conference and we're like, oh, you have bigger ideas than what you're doing, you know, what exam's coming up. Like, I do too. This is so cool and this is so special. And so every time we would go to a conference, those are the people that we wanted to meet up with. Other students would be looking for safety and comfort in the people that they knew from school. But we were the ones that were like, I'm going to go see Jess. She's from ICO. She's one of my best friends. I can't wait to meet up with her. It was just so beautiful. And, and I've maintained close relationships with those people to this day. Wow, that is absolutely fantastic. Now, the next part, two, two questions in one, I guess. Okay. We, we, social media, we could, we, we could be on these different platforms, do podcasts, do interviews, do all these, uh, speak for brands and all of that. At what point did you realize that, wait a minute, I can monetize this thing. I can actually start generating 
a substantial, a substantial or sustainable income from working with different brands? That's the one part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, have there been times where you refused to work with certain brands because of your ethics, your integrity, your character, or what that particular brand stands for? If you don't mind giving us insight into when did you realize that, wait a minute, I can make an income or generate revenue from these activities? Yeah, I think that as a profession in optometry, we're very hesitant to ask for things. We're very hesitant to be like, no, these are the things that I want and deserve. Um, you know, I first started realizing, hey, there's something to offer here when companies were inviting me to come to conferences and they wanted me to maybe like do a takeover or showcase their product um, or give me free, free glasses or something like that. That's when I realized, okay, there's an exchange of goods that's going to be going on. Once I started realizing, okay, this is just an, an exchange of goods, then I realized, okay, if it's not free product, it can be a monetary asset. Um, and so it was always then, it, and this was the most difficult cliff to climb over, was how do I change, how do I exchange my time, my knowledge, um, or my expertise or my actual service, which is maybe Instagramming, how do I exchange that not just for things in return, like a trip or a conference, you know, or free glasses, but how do I actually make that a monetary thing? That was the most difficult thing to do. And so, yes, there were companies that would say, sorry, we're really not interested in, in, um, you know, offering anything at this time, or, you know, we just don't have enough room in the budget. And I respectfully would say, okay, that makes sense. Like, please let me know when you have that availability to do that when that is in your budget. I was trying to be respectful. I was trying to, you know, kind of say, all right, but I'm not going to budge on this. You know, this is my time and I value it. Uh, and so since then, yes, there's been companies when I've kind of said, all right, we're not looking for the same thing. And that's okay because you want to feel like when you're going into a project, you're going to be valued. And if they're not going to, you know, give you exactly what you're looking for, then it's not a good partnership. So that's perfectly fine. You work with the brands that, that value your time and your expertise and what you have to give. And that's really the relationship that you want to look for. Um, yeah, sometimes I lost respect, but you have to, you know, when they didn't maybe want to compensate me in the way I was looking for. Um, but I think you also have to kind of look at it from, let me just make sure I'm aligning myself with good companies. So as much as it sucks to be like, okay, I guess I'm not going to get considered for this opportunity. It's okay because you're now opening yourself up to work with a brand that's going to be on the same wavelength that you are. Wow, that is. I was saying that social media could sometimes be seen as clout because behind the brands, uh, there isn't enough capacity in terms of what actually do those individuals do that have got these huge followings. Mm -hmm. However, in your case, I've noticed that you are invested in building your clinical expertise or competency, building up your business acumen, expanding your academic knowledge. Currently, what are you involved with outside of your brand in terms of your day-to-day -day work? And what areas of focus are you passionate about at the current moment? Yeah, I, I think the, the kind of the you know chasing clout in a in a sense is is interesting because i've kind of seen that too firsthand where you know all of a sudden overnight someone has like a million followers <laughs> but you look at the engagement and you're like the engagement's really unproportional to the amount of you know followers that you have so that's just a telltale sign like hey you might not be providing the most value um but there's enough room in social media and in optometry for everyone to, to do the same thing. Uh, I'm really interested in dry eye and dry eye management and dry eye treatment. And I, I don't think I'm that special. It's a huge growing interest in the U.S. area. Um, and so I ended up gaining a huge amount of clinical knowledge from a very good mentor, Dr. Melanie Denton here in North Carolina. So that's kind of what where I've been gravitating towards at least from a clinical perspective, trying to, to learn those things. Um, and yeah, that, you know, to speak to authenticity and, and why we're out here doing what we're doing, I think our generations maybe approached it a little differently and we can talk more about that. But I, I, I just think that information is really endless. You know, if we're not going to help share information and support one another so we can 
elevate our profession, then what are we doing this for? So, you know, again, I think it kind of gets back to what I was talking about earlier is, you know, why are you having the relationships that you're having? Is it for yourself? So you can leave a legacy behind? Sure. I mean, there's something that comes with that. But I think if you're going to be more altruistic and genuine, and you're actually going to do things for the next generation of optometry or for our current generation of optometry for patients, right? With that, all those my, things in mind, then that other, the results of that, or, you know, you'll reap the reward essentially of that altruism in your own career. So it'll just come. Wow. Wow. You seem to have a, a long-term view of <laughs> optometry. It's like you, you, you're doing the work now, but you're not building for now. You're building for, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now. Do you find that the, the younger generation or the younger optometry leaders or future leaders are, are impatient when it comes to what they want out of optometry? Or let me put it in another way. Mm. Are there gatekeepers? Because I know in South Africa, there are gatekeepers in our industry where the next generation does not necessarily create the opportunities for the next generation or the yeah and so people sort of like tend to relax and not get involved because they feel like this person has been in eye care for 40 50 years and they're still there do you guys have a similar challenge in america whereby young people are just not getting involved or if they do they want the immediate rewards like right now you know i think that's a that's a really good question of course when you're an owner, you have a lot more power. And, you know, from a proportion standpoint, the younger generation is mostly going to be associates. Uh, strong, strong, independent, and bold leaders are going to seek, you know, perhaps ownership earlier in their careers. Um, I think that, yes, the way that I see optometry in our younger generation, I would love for it to be very open-ended. I, I think that's something that we're good at. I think social media and almost this explosion of perhaps oversharing with all of our aspects of our life has maybe also changed our profession in that way in which our generation is just more open to sharing what we know. Um, you know, in terms though of our older generation, I feel like there are also a lot of great mentors who are open to sharing as well. And, I just think that we have to do that. We have to do that for our younger generation. We have to be open because, because of just, I don't know, longevity of the profession and elevation of the profession. In the U.S., a lot of our, what we can do, like our clinical skills, they're dictated by legislature, right? So we have to vote in what we can do. And because in the U.S., each state has a different legislature, there's some states where you can do things and then there's other states that you can't do things. Yeah. For example, th some states can do lasers, so they can do glaucoma procedures, they can do YAG capsulotomies, and other states just recently got the ability to prescribe oral medication. So there's this huge expansive difference, although we all share the unity of, hey, we went to the same school, we got the same education. When you go off after your career, you can't always do everything. And so I think at least in the U.S., we have this drive to really be united because we want the entire profession to move forward. And that's probably what really pulls into the hearts of the younger generation is we want to see that for not only ourselves, but we want to see it for our colleagues, too. Are we collaborating enough, though, as young people within the IK community? Because I have found that, like, let's say in your case, you're doing all these amazing projects, you're involved in multiple uh, aspects of ICAM. But then when I look at the companies that you have associated with, mm -hmm. they are sort of like bigger companies. And I look at other young people, I just don't find enough collaboration yeah. amongst peers. I find a lot of work taking place with maybe an organization that is more experienced, more broader than what you would be bringing to the table or as an offering. Why is that the case? Because in South Africa, I'm not collaborating with anyone my age group. I have been collaborating with people who are older than me. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Is it the same thing in America? So, Obi, what it is is that you need to be the bridge, right? Okay. I'm, I'm in the same position. We need to be the bridge. Um, yes, older generations, I mean, they didn't even really know what social media was. In the last three years, it's been 
you know, almost pulling teeth thing, saying, no, 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 you should hire me to do this. Like, how, you know, within the last year, I would say it really clicked with companies that are very, very big. Oh, wait, there's a value to this. We should spend money on social media instead of doing the same kind of advertising we've done throughout all of time. So people like you and I, we will always understand, hey, the younger generation has something to offer in terms of value. It's just taking companies a long time to realize that. And the companies that do realize that are going to be forward thinkers. They're going to be the first adapters. Um, and they'll probably have more success because they're not only, you know, bringing experts that are, yes, the same experts that you see rotate through the same lectures, but they're bringing fresh new ideas. I've always felt like the younger generation had an, a little bit of an edge up on it because we come out and we learn everything in school that's fresh, yeah. that's new. Like yeah. we're learning topics that no one, you know, in practice maybe have never really thought about or really even considered because they just didn't have curriculum training like that. Even my own experience, the people that are in school now, they know a lot more than I do. I never had a sutures lab. I'm really jealous of that. They get a sutures <laughs> lab. Um, but I never had that. And so I think it's just this change that we're in right now where companies really need to understand, hey, the younger generation have a lot to, to, to add to the conversation, but we are the ones that are going to have to be those people that build bridges. So my series that I have, it's called Medical Millennial on iTube, and that's yes. what I'm trying to do. I'm not, I mean, yes, there's experts that I think everyone can learn from and everyone can obtain great information for, from. It makes me feel good about myself when I can say, hey, Leslie O'Dell came on the Medical Millennial show. Like, how great am I? I got to interview one of the experts in dry eye. But it's also just as useful to interview a young optometrist, Corey Lappin, who's great at dry eye. Um, and hear his, his feedback. So I think that there's a lot of different, different aspects to how to bring younger people into that market. And as you, people like you and I who are excited to do that, we're just going to have to be the ones that, that keep working hard to make that possible for the next generation. Well, one thing that, or the few things that stand out the most about you, number one, uh, I'm looking at uh, the medical millennial uh, platform. I'm looking at your Instagram. I'm looking at just your different platforms. Mm -hmm. Excellence seems to be the driving force behind the work that you're producing. That's, that's number one. But number two, you bring people together along your journey. And that for me, it's one thing that I've seen people in Poland, people in Europe, people in Africa drawing or gravitating towards anything that you suggest as a campaign, as a project, uh, how did you go about fine tuning or harnessing that ability of bringing people towards you or, or, and, or to buy in into that which you have put before us? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think one of the questions you kind of sent me ahead of time is you're kind of asking about reputation and brand. Like, how do you build a reputable brand? And I kind of started thinking about that. And I'm like, shoot, I don't know. Did I do it consciously? Was there, was there something else going on? Um, but I think if we think about what a reputation is, it's really built on trust, right? And we gain trust through authenticity. Do we believe them? Do we trust them? It, you know, how, how much is what this person's saying actually relatable to my life? And I think the way to become more authentic then is to just be willing to be vulnerable. And a lot of people aren't willing to be vulnerable. A lot of people are, are putting up walls, wow. put up shells, and they're going to want to... <laughs> you know, especially with social media, it's, you have every, every capability to project the person that you want people to see you as you have every capability of doing that. I know what my social media should look like. If I wanted to have 50,000 followers, I should go out and hire a photographer and we should do a model shoot. I'm probably wearing, and I'm probably going to do this, wearing business casual clothes and, you know, oh, I'm just jet setting around the city life. Oh, like I'm just solving optometry's problems. No big deal. But that's not the actual life that I live. And that's not the way I feel. Even the way that you're describing me and my brand, I'm so like, I'm like flattered, but like, it's, it's crazy to hear because I just don't see myself that way. Um, you know, I think a lot of times, like I've cried on my social media when optometry school was really, really hard and the amount of DMS and the amount of like, I feel the exact same way that you do. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
that's what's been the driving force like behind me just opening up and, and really being vulnerable. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but I think it's just being authentic yeah, you, for you, level is being vulnerable. You spoke the truth. The, for me, it's, that's exactly why I'm going to you because there's no fluff in yeah. what you're doing. You know, there's no fluff. And I think the conscious too. decision that you did. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that's Sorry, what was that? Because when you're a young optometrist, you're scared of people's opinions of you. It's, you're so new. And sometimes I think to myself, do I really want to say this? Because will it put a target on my back if it's not the most popular opinion? Or, you know, if I sit here and I call out that we don't have enough diversity, is that going to tarnish my reputation? I'm just so new. Um, so it's a risk to do that, but I think it's necessary nonetheless. Remember earlier on, you said that you and I understand that we have to pay it forward. Yeah. Unfortunately, the type of that which comes with being building a reputable brand will come at a cost, will come with our sacrifices. And unfortunately, we're going to have, to, because we are sort of like that first generation of having to be academically excellent, clinically excellent, business excellent and at the same time create this new norm unfortunately there will be areas where we are gonna get the chopping head or our heads chopped because of the the, the, the the authenticity and that bravery that we have to say but this is not right this is not right I've had instances where we write a lot of books and uh, we took long to deliver a book to a particular uh, optometrist who had a lot of influence mm -hmm. and they made a comment on their public platforms mm -hmm. about the service delivery and we took a knock and i went to this person and i said i'm young you have been in the industry for 30 years instead of helping me and showing me where can i improve you did not even tell me that you are unhappy with how we delivered the book you already went on to your network mm -hmm. and you just made a comment without thinking that, wait a minute, this is a young man, how can I lift him up so that he does not repeat yeah. the same mistake that he has just done with me? And he looked back and he was like, wow, you actually changed my approach to IK. So don't be afraid of stepping out of your comfort zone and doing what is necessary in making IK better. Because you inspire me, by the way. Eh? You inspire so many people outside of America. You would be amazed at how big your brand is outside of America. That's so crazy to hear. It's so crazy to hear because like there were times when I thought, should I just like dissolve it or should I like, you know, you lose sight of what you're doing it for sometimes. Right. Um, yeah. So it's just like wild to hear that. That's the outside. I'm just so flattered. I, I don't even have words. I'm just really, <laughs> flattered. that's so kind of you to say that. Listen, uh, as we wrap this up, mm -hmm. what, what has been your biggest accomplishment so far? in IK and at the same time what has been your biggest setback in your IK journey so far? I think that my biggest setback was probably when I was in optometry school. I just had this moment you know I was if I'm going to be completely honest and I am vulnerable, so I'll just say it. I ended up creating my Instagram when I was a second year in optometry school. And prior to that, I was in a very serious relationship where I thought I was going to be with someone for forever is of course, you know, you always think. Um, and I moved out to Philadelphia I was from Ohio, moved out to Philly and I was doing school and we ended up breaking up. Right. That's fine. Everyone goes through breakups. But for me, I was, I sat back in that moment in time and I was like, wait, why am I doing what I'm doing? So it was a huge, huge setback to, to feel like I was alone on an island. I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing or where I was going to end up when I was graduating. Um, and that felt like the floor just fell out from underneath me. Wow. I felt like I wasn't a good person during that time. I felt like I was making decisions that were rash. I, I could have been a better friend. There's a lot of things just like that I think that did. And it, it set me back a huge, huge chunk. But wow. it gave me the time that I needed to one, heal. And 
it redirected my energy when I, when I started turning to social media, it kind of gave me another way to rediscover who I was and what I wanted to do. Wow. I kind of think about it and I feel like my biggest accomplishment in times was my, was creating eyesights and creating this platform for people to just synapse and, and talk openly about the profession and, you know, put the profession on a visual scale. Um, and so that's been tough too, because I've kind of said, all right, I feel like I've checked that off and I've accomplished that. What's next? So there's always like this drive to figure out what you want to do next and, and what you want to do. Um, I think the single handed though, biggest accomplishment was passing my North Carolina board exam. Cause it's a very tough licensing exam where you have to go in and it's an oral exam where you face examiners and they give you cases and you just have to answer all the cases. It, it really wasn't until passing that exam that I realized I was like, okay, this is it. Like I've, I've made it. Like I felt like that was a huge accomplishment where I, of course I was doing everything for myself, but it just felt like that one was one that I, or, you know, it just felt like that one was something I did really, really for myself. Like I could have gotten licensed, wow. anywhere, but passing that exam, it just hit differently and that it meant something different. And maybe I'll be able to, in our editing process, maybe I'll be able to share the Instagram that I made on the day I found out my, I passed my licensing, but I think it would speak maybe a little bit more to like the things I was feeling. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, just how you answered that, you could see that it's going back to this whole conversation about just you, you've poured your heart into what you give uh, the IK community. And that comes across so real, so authentically, so, so simple, you know, so easy. And I honor you for that because not a lot of leaders, uh, vulnerability comes at a risk. Yeah, It's a massive risk. I think to be able to be a leader at the top of your game and still be vulnerable throughout that process, I think that's one of the biggest risks that we can take but you have taken it by the uh, by, by head on and you are doing such a an, uh, an, uh, phenomenal job. And how do you balance though the, the time? Because you've got multiple platforms, you've got, you're dealing with multiple stakeholders at any given point in time, but you also want to make a difference, but you also need to get paid and work <laughs> every single day. How do you find the balance? Okay, I have like the best advice to, for anyone. You can't do it alone. You just can't do it alone. Listen, I'm not okay. married. I'm single. I'm in a city where I don't know a ton of people, but I do know one person and it's my cousin. And so my cousin, I pay her 10% of what I get from my contracts and she's my employee for my S Corp, which is you know my social media. Um, and she helps so much. Like I, the 10% is not even, it's not, it doesn't even measure up to like how much of a role she plays in helping me maintain my sanity. Wow. I mean, even if it's like a virtual assistant, hire them. Response to emails, helps me negotiate contracts. She's an advocate for my social media too. So in times when I'm like, uh, I don't really want to create content. She's like, nope, we got to do it. We're doing it today. So you definitely need to have someone that's on your team with the same vision. If it's a family member, if it's your significant other, which I think you, you guys work together very closely. hundred right? percent. People, people yeah. think that my wife is an optometrist. My wife has got her own career. <laughs> she's got her yeah. own career. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's that she's involved with just uh, believing in my pipe dream as if it was hers. And I also have that responsibility of ensuring that I believe in her and her dreams as if they were mine. And Thank you so much for sharing that personal story with us on the master. This is at the end of the day, this is the master class series. The people that are going to be watching this are going to be learning things that are going to impact and change them for the better. And so thank you so much for sharing that personal experience. That was a setback for yourself, which enabled you then to divert your attention elsewhere throughout your healing process, because we don't speak a lot about such things. So thank you very much for sharing that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Wow, this is, this is, <laughs> do you know that um, uh, when I started connecting with, I have never shared this with you before, but when yeah. I started connecting with people overseas and looking at brands that are doing phenomenal work, mm. two brands or two people were top of everything that I was trying to build as a brand. And that was you and Dr. Daryl Glover. Yeah. The two of you set the, the, the basis of 
what do I want my brand to look like? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what is it that I want the brand to represent? And I think throughout this masterclass series or to this topic for today, you have really given us so much wisdom in terms of what's involved in building a reputable brand. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. You know, and I wish you all the success in the world. Eh? Thank you. Yeah, I hope I gave everyone a lot of value. If you want to get in top touch with me, you can email me, um, Emily, E-M-I-L-I-E, last name sites, S-E-I-T-Z-O-D at gmail.com. I also have a Instagram that's about my journey in optometry and it's called iSites because my last name is Sites. So that's E-Y-E-S-E-I-T-Z. Um, and you can check out our show, Medical Millennial on iTunes. Uh, but thank you everyone. This is great. <laughs> this is this is um, my notes <laughs> for today. I saw you taking notes and I was like, oh my goodness. Oh my this goodness. This is my notes. This is my notes. So I hope that's it's just- tangible. That's what I hope. <laughs> I hope it's tangible. Like I hope people can like hear my experience and like put it into, into actual practice. Like I want, I, I would love to do something like that too. And maybe we're going to collaborate on, on something then to, to make it, yeah, to make it happen. Uh, 10 years from now, Last point, 10 years from now, where's where's Emily? I think I'll probably have my own practice. It's really hard once you feel like that entrepreneurial drive, I think, to deny yourself of that. Um, But I I think I'll be working pretty heavily in industry. I'd love to do that. Uh, And I think I'd like to have my own practice and make my own little impact on on the community. And um, yeah, hopefully be able to just continue on and, and keep giving valuable tips for people that are, are in the same situation that want to do something like I'm doing. I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray Thank for that. You. Everyone, <laughs> everyone, that was another fantastic masterclass series. This has been a complete privilege and honor to be able to sit with one of my favorite optometrists, Dr. Emily Sides, because of what she represents as a brand in IK is truly something that is going to be redefining IK on a global stage. Make sure you tune in to the Vision Straight platforms. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure that you're subscribing right now. Until the next episode, everyone, take care. Bye. Yay!